All right, as we begin tonight, let's be turning in our Bibles again to Hosea chapter 1. Last week, we began looking at a study of the text, and right now we are working, as per our outline, we're working under the first major section of, of the book bearing the prophet's name, chapters 1 through 3, which, can sit, which deal with Israel's adultery. Uh, the second main section, as you would note on the outline, chapters 4 through 13, will deal with Israel's ungodliness in a more descriptive form. And then chapter 14 will deal, will deal as with Israel's restoration. However, as you look at the outline, under the first main section consists of three subsections. And it's the first subsection which we are concerning ourselves with in this study, and that is chapter 1, uh, dealing with Israel's adultery, looking at the signs, the signs of promised judgment due to her sins. And so last week we began a study, and really we basically only got through verse number one, in which we looked at the fact that the word that Hosea spoke was not of his own doing, it was not of his own thinking, but rather it came from God. And we looked at several examples throughout the entire the Old Testament in which this phrase, the word of the Lord, came unto as it related to these holy men of old. And in fact, we looked at it in principle as well in, in the New Testament to show that the word that these individuals spoke was from God and that what they were speaking was the will of God. And I think that's very important to note to, to show to us, to, to remind us that the scriptures, this precious book we hold in our hand, came directly to us from God. And as it related to the prophet, it would certainly hold that what God would say to him, what he would receive afterwards, beginning here in verse number 2, would be God's very word. And so we come to verse number 2, and we briefly touched upon this last week, at, or two weeks ago, excuse me, at the tail end of class. And again, we see the phrase, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And certainly this, the phrase here indicates that what God says here is transpiring at the beginning of, of his prophetic ministry at the time that God commissioned him to the prophetic office. And so here he begins his instruction in, in verse, verses 2 through 9 we see instructions regarding number 1 whom he was to marry. This is going to take in verses 2, 2 and 3. And then verses 4 through, four through 8, 4 through 9, excuse me, is going to deal with some instructions regarding the naming uh, of the children. But under this section regarding who he was to marry, we, we look in verse number 2, that, that God, Jehovah tells Hosea to go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. And for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord, or departing from Jehovah. Now, question, and I think we threw this question out two weeks ago. As we think about the phrase, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, did God tell Hosea to marry a literal harlot? And I think many of us would agree. And I think the evidence, well, in my study, I find there's evidence that backs both views, but I believe it's this former view, the fact that, that she was a literal harlot. Now, why would God tell Hosea, and we're going to get more into the evidence here in just a moment, but as we think about this, why would God tell Hosea to marry such a woman? That is an excellent thought, Dusty. That's, that's, you, you're really hitting the nail on the head with that explanation, dealing with the hurt that God would feel. And again, that, as, we, as these first three chapters unfold, Ho, Hosea's marriage is literally going to be a, a living parable for Israel, an object lesson, if you will, a living sermon for, for Israel. Well, the nation is such a bad, bad, bad shape this time. I think it represents it like it also. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in reality, what we're going to see tonight, we're going to back all the way up to, to the days of Samuel on Sunday morning in our lesson there, and we're going to see not much, that things weren't drastically different there in chapter 7 of 1 Samuel. Because the idolatry that Israel's going to be, that is 
Israel's guilty of here. We're told, we're going to find out in 1 Samuel 7 in our study on Sunday morning that Samuel instructed Israel to put away her idols. So in reality, what we're studying tonight is going to really, in Sunday is really going to go hand in hand as, as it were. Especially as it helps us see the history of Israel and her unfaithfulness to God. So, so a woman of her background really would be unworthy of being his bride, would she not? And, uh, and certainly Israel by, was unworthy of being God's bride. But, uh, but it also, I believe, here would depict what God had done. Hosea's marriage would depict what God had done in taking Israel as his own. Remember from the beginning, Israel was unfaithful to God, was she not? What, you know, what, what even happened as, soon, what happened as soon as they left Egypt? They had the compl- problem with murmuring and complaining. They even wanted to go back, did they not? They wanted to turn back to Egypt. And uh, so she had a, she did, so Israel was unfaithful, we might say, from the beginning, was she not? And I think, you know, Dusty, what you pointed out, this help, you know, this brings gl- greater clarity to, to the view that Hosea's wife, Gomer, was a harlot, a literal one. I think this is going to help, and as we're going to further explain here in just a moment. And, and, certainly we see, and certainly we see the problems that Israel had with idolatry at Mount Sinai, do we not? Exodus 32, golden calf. Golden calf. Right. And... Uh, And so we might say as such, Israel was never worthy of God's favor. But yet he took Israel as his people and he worked to turn them from their wicked ways. Now, as I studied this lesson, as we consider the two views, and as we most of us probably believe, and certainly I do, that Gomer was a literal harlot, Warren Wearsby in his commentary I found offers an excellent explanation of this phrase. And he holds to this view view that Gomer was a literal harlot. He writes that in the Old Testament, prostitution is symbolic of idolatry and unfaithfulness to God. Since the Jews were idolatrous from the beginning, it seems likely that Gomer would have to be a prostitute when she married Hosea. For this would best symbolize Israel's relationship to the Lord. God called Israel... In her idolatry, he married them at Mount Sinai when they accepted his covenant, Exodus 19 through 21. And then he grieved over them when they forsook him for the false gods of the land of Canaan. Like Gomer, Israel began as an idolater, married Jehovah, and eventually returned to her idolatry. Now, let's look at this. Let's look at several passages in connection with, 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 this, with what we're working on here. Turn with, let's turn over to the book of Joshua. And we alluded to, this, to, the, to the fact they had issues with idolatry at Sinai in Exodus chapter, chapter 32. But let's look at Joshua chapter 24. And let's look at what, jo- what Joshua told Israel in verse number 14. And in fact, here in this text, we find Joshua alludes to the that Israel had idol problems even while in, it, while in Egypt, while enslaved to Egypt. And if someone would, read verse number 14 for us here of Joshua 24. Well, thank you, Dusty. And so what does this verse tell us? That their ancestors... You know, going all the way back to the other side of the flood. But also in where? Egypt. So what does this tell us about Israel and idolatry? Always had a problem with it, even in Egypt. And I think that's a very very important verse to to consider as as we consider the evidence for this view. Now let's look very briefly at the southern kingdom of Judah. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. And notice with me in verses 1 through 11 what God said to, to Judah. And, um, and, uh, and I think it's very important to note here that 
God is alluding once again to, to, the, to Israel's harlotry, but then he's going to expose Judah as well for, for the same sin here in ver, verses 1 through 11 of Jeremiah chapter 3. And so notice verse 1, you know, it said, If a man put away his wife, she go from him to become another man's. Shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? And, uh, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. And again, he's speaking to Israel here. And with the lovers under consideration were, were all those false gods, were they not? But God says, Thou hast yet, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. And, um, and then he uses the an analogy, verse 2 tells her to lift up thine eyes into the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. And, um, and this depicts really her pollution of the land with all of her whoredoms and, and, and wickedness. And uh, certainly verse 5 talks about the anger of the Lord. Will he reserve his anger forever or will, will he keep it to the end? And obviously, ultimately, we understand God poured out his judicial wrath on Israel for her sin. Now look at, look at verses 6 and, and following. And God here is speaking to Jeremiah in the days of Josiah the king. And Josiah no doubt was a righteous king. And he indeed strove to the best of his ability, to, to, to rid J Judah of all the high places. But again, you know, to, you know, godly men such as Josiah and Jeremiah couldn't do it alone. And so, so the question is posed to Judah here. Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? And uh, she's gone up and upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Now, now, in this section, God through Jeremiah is going to tell Judah, your sin's greater than Israel's. But why would Judah's sin be greater than Israel's in this context? What's that? Well, it came through Judah. But uh, you're exactly right, Dusty. But is it not her sin not more, isn't her guilt more greater than Israel's because Judah, the southern kingdom, saw what Israel did and yet she refused to turn from it. In fact, God says in verse number 8, I put her away, gave her a bill of d divorce, yet her treacherous sister, Judah, did... What did she not do? She didn't fear. But, but what does she do instead of fearing God when she saw Israel being put away by God? What does Judah do instead? Same thing. And isn't, that, isn't this a sad statement? That Judah, and this is why they would go, and this is why God would use the Babylonians to punish Judah. The same sin. And isn't this a sad indictment on, on, the, na on the nation as a whole? They could have averted disaster, could they not? But they chose to follow in, in the same way. And so as a result, we're told in verse 10, Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly. And when you think about that word, feignedly, what, what comes to mind? What? Or half-heartedly, yeah. Half-heartedly, you know. God demands the totality of His people, does He not? Christ said the greatest commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all what? Thine heart. Whereas Judah only gave God half their heart. And, that's, you know, and that pretty much sums up the, 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 the entire history of Israel, does it not? Half-hearted service and devotion to God. And so I believe we're painting this picture. I think, and I believe, and I think you would agree, that, that these passages are really you know, demonstrating to us the, the kind of people Israel was and certainly would, would certainly coincide with the reality that Gomer was an actual harlot. But let's look at one more. One more passage to build upon. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 23. One of the most, if not the most graphic chapter that deals with their idol problem is seen here in the prophet Ezekiel. 
And, uh, and in this chapter, Ezekiel describes the harlotry of both Samaria and Jerusalem. Not subtly. <laughs> when you study this chapter, it, he's, it's very graphic. And, it, and it's descriptive of two things. Number one, their idolatry. But also, number two, the political alliances they, they attempted to make with the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and, and even to a certain extent, the Babylonians. And certainly when we come back, when we get on later on, when we get later on in the book of Hosea, God through Hosea there is also going to call Israel on, on this, how they would flit about trying going between Egypt and all of these foreign countries looking for aid rather than trusting God. And what happens if we put all of our... What, happen, what happens when men decide to lean upon other men rather than God? What's the end result? Going to fail. That's exactly right, Ricky. God will never leave us nor forsake us. As you, you know, men let us down from time to time, but God never will. And we're reminded of the passage in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, well, who can be against us? And the answer is no one. You know, I'd rather have God on my side than, than you know, and I think we all do. But uh, as, we, as you look at this section of Scripture and, and, and you think about verses 31 and, and through th 35, he pronounces, you know, God pronounces punishment on, on Judah. In, uh, and he says, verse 27, literally, I'm going to strip you out of, out of these clothes. Take away thy fair jewels by which she had adorned herself for these, for these idols. And we're going to get more into this in chapter 2 here of the book of Hosea. But uh, he says, I'm going to take away thy lewdness. And as a result, because, that is, Judah had walked in the way of her sister, that's referring to Israel, and she sa he says, I'll give her cup into thine hand. And God tells Judah, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. And, uh, and, it, and it's really descriptive of her, her, of her punishment here. And uh, she would drink of the same cup Israel did, of, of, and that's the cup of God's wrath. And uh, though Judah would not be wiped off the map, as it were, as Israel was. And, and in fact, Hosea is going to affirm this fact here, here later on in the chapter and uh, beginning, beginning, beginning in, in verse number 6. Well, verse 7, excuse me. God's going to give Judah a gl glimpse of hope through the prophet here. And so unlike Israel where God would wipe off the map, you know, Judah would be brought back into the land, be brought back into, into Jerusalem. And, the, and we understand the ultimate purpose of this. And Hosea is going to explain, and we're going to see this when we come to the tail end of the chapter, is with, when we deal with the messianic purpose of this, the Christ that was to come. And I think it's very interesting to note, too, as we study these chapters. You see the beginning, you look at this. The first, th first two chapters are specially constructed this way. First of all, you see God pronouncing judgment on Israel. Then what do we see at the end? Hope. And that hope is fulfilled in Christ. He's going to talk about it here at the tail end of chapter 1. He's going to talk about it in the latter portion of chapter 2. And the entirety of chapter 3, that short, the short five-verse chapter, is going to deal, you know, deal exclusively with Hosea redeeming Gomer as a type of God redeeming Israel and ultimately a type of our, of our redemption through, through Christ Jesus. And, and as I mentioned in, in our introductory study, there's a, there's a lot of messianic intimations in this book. But as I studied this first chapter, as I've studied this and put together the lessons for the chapter, there's more to it than just what we've alluded to. This is some rich, we're going to see some very rich material, faith building material in, in, the, in this chapter, especially as it relates to Christ. Exactly. Yep. It is. You know, there's always that temptation, you know, if we're not careful. 
So, so we've noted the scriptural evidence as to the view that Gomer was an actual harlot. Now let's, let's look at the evidence for the other view. And again, we're setting this forth to, to show both views are plausible. Charles Pledge offers this explanation for the view that she was not a literal harlot, but was rather a pure woman when Hosea married her, but suggests who possessed the tendencies which would produce and did produce harlotry in her life. He notes that the word harlotries is in the plural, which would indicate that it was the nature or disposition of Gomer that was involved. He says if this is an actual event in the life of Hosea, it would fully conform to the anti-type of Israel. All of the time necessary for the children to be born and reared would provide a perfect analogy for Israel to view herself by. This would involve a lengthy time during which Gomer would slowly apostatize from her loving husband and eventually leave him altogether. This is what was involved in Israel's departure from God and you know, not one sudden step which took her completely away from God. Israel apostatized in degrees until finally her apostasy was complete and she forsook her loving husband, God. This seems to be the way it was with Gomer. She was not a harlot, Pledge suggests, when she married Hosea, but rather possessed those tendencies that drew her into harlotry after she had been married to Hosea for several years. Now again, I believe, and I, believe, and I think most of us here do, that the evidence suggests she was a literal harlot. However, you know, either view can be held without doing violence to the text because both hold and affirm the sordid unfaithfulness of Hosea's wife as a picture of the sordid unfaithfulness of Israel. So, um, you know, if, if one wants to hold to this other view, you, you can, because it ultimately comes down to the same thing. But I believe that the evidence is there, powerful evidence that suggests she was an actual harlot. Now, having considered that, and I know we spent quite a bit of time on that, and I, and I knew we would, what was the design for doing this? What, now, why would God tell Hosea to, to, to do this? Why go take a wife into, of whoredoms? What does, verse, what does the latter portion of this verse reveal? In, thank you, Dusty. Indeed, God, God had a purpose in mind, did he not? And so he was going to use, so he's going to use this marriage to teach Israel a, a lesson. And uh, it would, this marriage would serve as an object lesson, as we've already alluded to. Now, when we think about the description here, it's, a, it's really a vivid and graphic description of Israel's rejection of God, is it not? And... Um, the land here, I looked this up, the land is a metonymy, which is a figure of speech in which a thing or concept is not called by its own name, but rather by the name of something associated in meaning with that thing or concept. The land here is the metonymy, which stands for the people. So here, Hosea, is not, God's not saying the physical land, but rather he's saying the inhabitants. And he's using this term land to describe the inhabitants hath committed great whoredom. This phrase just is a summation, as it were. Really, it, it summarizes the unfaithfulness of Israel. And again, you know, the word great here is an adjective describing their whoredoms. That it was great. Not in the sense of, you know, something that's really good. As, we might, as it's often used, but great can also dis denote something that's widespread, as it were. So here the word great dis describes this term whoredom to, dis to, to denote just how widespread their sin was, how deep-rooted her sin was, and how unfaithful she had become. As we think about this description in... Uh, and I think the phrase here at the tail end of the verse is very significant as well. Departing from the Lord. What does it mean to depart from God? Or when you depart from something, what does that mean? To leave or you know, to go away from. As you said, Ricky, to turn away from. And so Israel here had turned away, went away, left, gone away from God. 
Hey, that's exactly right. You, you had to have been there at one time to depart. And uh, that's, you know, if you're, not, if you're never there, you can't depart, can you? And so they were at one time in a close relationship with God, but obviously they turned their backs on them. Isaiah describes it, and again, we're very familiar with Isaiah 59, verse 2, where he talks about how it, your, the iniquities separate us between, our, uh, between man and God, and, and sins hide his face from us. But in verse 13, when, it, when Isaiah talks about Israel's walking in darkness, he talks about how they transgressed and lied against the Lord, and in so doing, departed from God. They had turned their backs on God and went away from God. And the, and the same thing happens today. A, as Christians, is it po still possible for us today, today to depart from God? Indeed, if we're not careful. To sin against God is, is to depart from God, is it not? It's literally to turn our back on God. And, uh, and really, when we depart from God... When you think about what we're doing, when, when, when men depart from God, it's really to, to sell themselves into sin, is it not? Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse number 3 regarding Israel that they, you know, they had sold themselves, but they sold themselves for naught. It's empty. It's worthless. You know, what, what good does sin bring a person? That's exactly right, Dusty. And our, those pleasures don't last, do they? And uh, as Israel would find out, and as so many have found out today, so they had sold themselves for naught. However, as we think about this, and I think we've already alluded to it as well in our study of Joshua 24, Jeremiah 3, and Ezekiel 31, or 26, Israel played the harlot in, in two ways. Or 23, Ezekiel 23, excuse me. Israel played the harlot in two ways. Obviously, number one, she joined herself to idols. And again, as we've mentioned, idolatry was a big problem for Israel even before she entered the promised land. And even prior to the establishment of the northern kingdom. You go back to the days after Solomon died, and you, when his son Rehoboam ascended to the throne, remember, remember what he did? Remember the wise counsel of the older men? They, uh, he had placed burdens on the people, and the older men asked him, you know, you need to lighten the burdens. But the younger men wanted what? They wanted to, to afflict even more. So, so who did Rehoboam listen to? Did he listen to the wise men, or did he listen to the foolish younger men? He listened to the foolish younger men. That in turn led a, revolt, led a revolt led by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And that in turn led to the establishment of the northern kingdom of Israel, of which Jeroboam was the first king. When Jeroboam ascended to the throne, and let's turn over there right quick as we're talking about this. 1 Kings chapter 12. Shortly after Rehoboam ascended to the throne in Israel, we might say Israel's downfall really began here. Instead of serving God, let's look at what Jeroboam did. In verse 25, we're told that, that Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Penuel. Now notice verse 26. Jeroboam said in his heart, he thought, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of Israel. Verse 27, he says, If this people go, go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, which was part of the southern kingdom, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of, king of Judah. So here, what was Jeroboam afraid of? According to this verse, verse 27. He's afraid of losing his throne, was he not? And so he decides in verse number 28 to make two what? Two 
two golden calves. And again, you're, this is hearkening back to Exodus 32 all over again, is it not? Two golden calves and set them up at Dan and Bethel. Now, what's he going to tell Israel upon setting these up? Who, who were these golden calves for the Israel? Their gods which brought them up out of Egypt. Now, what happened according to verse number 30 here? Became a sin. So, so, so instead of worshiping the God of heaven... They decided to do what? Worship these false gods. And they did not go where God prescribed. And so we and so I think verse 30, we might say, and I don't think it's too far fetched, the events here with Jeroboam really served as a turning point in the history of Israel. Do, do, do they not? Because I believe here is from this time onward, it really, her downfall was swift. Because certainly their guilt of idolatry becomes worse and worse over time. You know, we see her desire for these grow worse. And so that's, that's the first way in which Israel played the harlot. The second way was in joining, joining herself to foreign nat- nations. As we talked about, she depended on foreign nations. And so we're, go- we're going to find that the leaders made decisions without even considering God in their plans. And uh, look at with me very quickly at Hosea chapter 7 and verse number 11. We're, we're going to jump ahead here, but I, but I bring this out for a pu- purpose. To see, to see how God views such shenanigans. In uh, Hosea chapter 7, verse number 11. In uh, Ephraim also is like a... Here's an interesting metaphor. Silly dove. I've preached a sermon on this passage before titled A Silly Dove. And I was visiting a congregation a few years ago and it turned out where I, was pre- where I preached a sermon at as a guest preacher... Turned out it was dove hunting season. Seriously, it was, because several there told me they were going dove hunting afterwards. Talked about, you know, and a dove, you know, just it flits about, flits about between two things. And so Israel here is described as being that dove. And, and God uses the comparison they call to Egypt. You know, they called out to Egypt for help, but ultimately they would go to Assyria. That is the Assyrians would take them captive. And uh, he goes on down through here describing why they would here, here, here later on. But I'll point that out to show, you know, to show how Israel played the harlot in that second sense with their political alliances rather than consulting God. And, uh, and, you know, it's futile to leave God out of one's plans, is it not? They were serving as an example for us. It did Oh, exactly, Ricky. That, that's a great applicational point. The need for us to lean upon God through prayer. And, uh, you, know, you know, lean upon His will. Trust in Him. And, uh, and prayer draws us closer to God. And in this day and age, we need to be drawing closer to God rather than going away from God. And, <laughs> but that's what Israel did, was it not? Was instead of going, growing closer to God, they were growing, growing further away from God. Again, the spirit of godlessness, ungodlessness, godliness, and a, an attempt to remove God from every vestige of society. And, it, and it's sad. It, you know, our work is cut out for us. And, uh, and so really, the, you know, we might say, and our time is up here, and you know, we're going to finish this verse, but, you know, really... The general condition hasn't changed much since the days of this of Hosea, has it? Exactly, Dusty. Ecclesiastes chapter one. And again, you, you think about the perspective he wrote from there, melancholy. He's at the tail end of his life, and he was writing from experience how a life lived separate and apart from God was foolishness. 
There's nothing new. And so, as we sum up verse number 2, Hosea's marriage, his broken marriage, would, would serve as Israel breaking her marriage with God by playing the harlot, just as Gomer would break hers in, in, in playing, playing the harlot. All right, we'll put a peg there.